Soul songs, what we're looking at, soul songs in the book of Psalms, yeah? And what sort of subject matter inspires the best songs? Love. Love, yeah. Love. And being, and being love lorn, yeah? Being forsaken in love, broken hearted, hardship, difficulty, poverty, hard times, misery, depression. These are basically the stuff of great art. Yeah? They are. I mean, Mozart, how could Mozart develop the, the, the musical stuff? I mean, it's radical in his day. How could he develop all of that kind of tragic life? Adele has said she's too happy at the moment to write any songs. Adele, thank you. I heard that on the radio. What a wonderful. Can everybody stop heckling that? But that's really <laughs> good. Adele. Adele has said recently she's not coming up with any songs because she's had a baby and stuff like that. And she's so ecstatically happy she can't produce songs. She can't sing. She's too happy. Often. That is the way it works. The stuff great art and great ballads are made of is misery and depression and hardship and life's rubbish. Yeah? yeah? And often in the Psalms, that is pretty much the way it works out. Look at Psalm 88. That is as grim as it gets. That is a bad day. But not this Psalm. Not Psalm 23. Psalm 23 sings of sufficiency and satisfaction. And you know, the big shock is that it is a human being who's singing this song. Because human beings don't work like that. Do they? No. How does it begin? Oh, family came round. Yeah. <laughs> when the beach it rained. You know, that's human nature, isn't it? And here is a guy, counter to human nature, counter to what we normally see of human experience. And he's singing a song, and he's singing of satisfaction. Psalm 23, the song of satisfaction. It is unnatural for human beings to be satisfied, let alone to sing of their satisfaction. And also because of the nature of human pride, it is utterly unusual, isn't it, for a human to sing of their satisfaction, placing themselves inside that piece of non-literal language, as a well-shepherded sheep. I am a sheep. Huh? We don't sing like that. We are leaders. I'm sorry, this is, a, this is a cultural reference that you could take in a derogative fashion, please don't. Well, maybe do, but, but this, is a, this is a problem. All the stuff coming out of America at the moment, all the big blog sites, all the big pastors, leadership, be a leader. You can't build a church completely of leaders. But this guy's singing about being a sheep and his dependency on a shepherd. Something rather unusual is going on. It's this unusual sort of song of satisfaction, the song of a satisfied, self-confessed sheep. It's all unusual. So this song is alien to most human experience. See, we're so familiar with it. Oh, yes, Psalm 23, Cremont. The oh, Lord's my shepherd. Yeah, that I'm you know. Yeah. So, you know, we're so but it's such an unusual thing to be happening. I want us to see that. Here's the fundamental fact that sets the psalmist up as a satisfied man. You can almost stop there. Here's the key to it. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. What's the authorised? Come on, tell me what you used to. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. It's fair enough. That's in the same sort of ballpark, isn't it? Except one is good news for modern man and one is good news for Neanderthal man. Right? That's about where we're at, isn't it? Okay, it's the same thing. We're okay with that. Here's the fundamental fact that sets the psalmist out as a satisfied man. And here's the fundamental feature of this psalm. The psalmist relates to the Lord as a sheep to the best shepherd imaginable. Which means that all his needs are satisfied and more. In fact, his cup flows over the top. Some of us might consider that a waste. So what have we got going on here? Covenant of God is my shepherd. Crucial. Crucial start. We'll come back to it. The divine name. You know, Jehovah, Yahweh, the name you can't say but we try to. Right? That one. He is my shepherd. The covenant keeping God. The faithful one. 
the covenant God, the shepherd of Israel. There is a profoundly theological and a profoundly salvation history foundation to the psalmist's satisfaction. The one who's my shepherd is the one who's been the covenant keeping God throughout the ages to Israel, to his people. He's the one. He's the one who's proved himself all the time through history and the experience of the people of God to bring them through every dark valley. And the most fundamental dark valley of all. The valley of death. And that idea of God as his people's shepherd, the covenant of God, goes right back to Genesis 49. Joseph's a fruitful vine, of what fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. Is he? No, it's a piece of non-literal language. But look, you've got the picture. Yeah, wow, that's some sort of vine, isn't it? That one's soaking up the nutrients. That one's getting the sun. That one's doing good. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility, but his bow remained steady. His strong arm stayed supple because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. Because of your father's God who helps you. Because of the Almighty who blesses you. Now there's nothing distinctive about this metaphor of the shepherd in scripture. It's used in a number of other psalms, Psalm 77, Psalm 18 verse 2, Psalm 95 verse 7, on and on and on. It's not unusual in Israel's history to think of God as Israel's shepherd. But what really stands out here in this psalm, Psalm 23, is the use of the personal pronoun. The Lord is, not Israel's shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd. And that's a big deal. That's a stunning, shocking... So we, you see, this is it. We're up against this all the time. We are so used to the Lord is my shepherd. But, you know, as soon as somebody reads that psalm, Psalm 23, the day it's written, What? Are you kidding? My shepherd? And that's the unique contribution of this in Scripture. The shepherd of Israel has become my shepherd. And in the words of the old Welsh hymn, you know, Thou shepherd of Israel and mine. Shepherd of Israel and mine. The joy and desire of my heart. The closer communion I pine, I long to reside where thou art. There's the point. Thou shepherd of Israel and mine. My, I, I. That's what's distinctive in this here. The Lord is my shepherd. So there's a profoundly theological Salvation history foundation to the psalmist's satisfaction. It goes back a long way. It's a solid, sure foundation. But there's a profoundly personal and experiential, in my experience, foundation to it too. And we make a serious mistake when our faith is not profoundly theological, based on revealed truth. Salvation historical, based on what God has been known to do. And personal. And in my experience, day by day, experiential to you. The Lord is my shepherd. Should we use the rest of our time on that? <laughs> yeah. Theological, because it is in response to his self-revelation in Scripture, and on the basis of the truth that he reveals in it, that Christians have life and liberty and anything worth calling Christian. Salvation history, because revelation has been progressive up until the sending of the Saviour. None of this began with us. It's been progressive up to the sending of the Saviour, the Spirit, the canon of Scripture. We're not the first to follow you. Personal, because God holds each individual responsible personally for the way we've kicked against him. The soul that sins shall die, he says, but the soul that turns from sin to follow the Saviour is going to be saved and saved forevermore. My sin is not anyone else's problem, not anyone else's responsibility, it's mine. But the soul that turns from sin to follow the Saviour is going to be saved forevermore, and if that's me, that he is mine. The Lord is my shepherd. It's personal, and it's experiential, because a theoretical what do we know about theoretical Christianity living in here? Too much? A theoretically repenting, believing person cannot say the Lord is my shepherd. It's not your shepherd. You can sing it in the hymns, you can sing it in the services you go to every now and again. It's not true. 
It's not until you've got that personal experience of the Lord as your shepherd can you say the Lord is my shepherd. A theoretical shepherd's no use to you. He won't feed you, he won't dip you, he won't trim your feet, and he won't give you a drink, right? It's part of a theoretical shepherd. Now that, says the psalmist, is the key to personal needs met and satisfaction secured. He's singing of satisfaction with all these issues that are going to arise now because the Lord is his shepherd. This is what follows from him. That's what he's got to say. And here's how it goes. On our own, we're like sheep out of the flock, wandering, vulnerable, alone, the sad prospect of the sheep without the shepherd. Jesus is moved by that, isn't he? He looks at the people and he says, you're like sheep without a shepherd. Matthew 9, Jesus went through all the towns and villages. That's very important. Jesus was concerned about villages. Good. <laughs> Teaching in their synagogues. Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. Healing every disease and illness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they needed a health service. No. Not because they needed a health service, but because they were harassed. And they were helpless. And they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers of you asked the Lord of the harvest to send that workers into his harvest field. Because they're like sheep without a shepherd. See, the unshepherded sheep is in a pretty poor position. Overgrown feet. Foot rot. Riddled with worms. Maggots. Who's going to defend the sheep against these things? Because it cannot defend itself against them. We've got sheep near us in this state. Somebody owns them. Oh yes, somebody owns them. But in practical terms, nobody shepherds them. One pulled up on our door, kitchen doorstep and died the other day. Yeah, fly strike, full of maggots, killed it. Came over and there it was. Sheep without a shepherd is a miserable beast. It's grim. We don't get that because we're so, you know, we're so used to crimond. We're so used to what we sing at the funerals and weddings. You know, you sing it quickly at the wedding, you sing it slowly at the funeral. But it's the same thing, isn't it? The Lord's more shepherd. Good, because a sheep without a shepherd is a miserable beast. But the psalmist is clear that the Lord is his shepherd. Shepherdless sheep have got problems with parasites, they've got problems with overheating because they haven't been shorn. They've got rest and security issues because who's protecting them from all the predators that are out there? They've got a problem with direction, they just wander. Wander about. They've got issues with food and water and where they're going to find them. And what's, what's going to become of them? They're going to die in a ditch somewhere? That's the trouble with shepherdless sheep, they're miserable beasts. But the psalmist is clear that because the Lord is his shepherd, he is going to lack nothing. See the contrast, it's a huge contrast. We don't get it usually. The consequence is explicit in the construction in the Hebrew. So long as the Lord is my shepherd, I suffer no lack. It's not a future tense. It's not a future. That's sadly, no. But there is this consequential thing. So long as the Lord is my shepherd, given that the Lord is my shepherd, because of that, as a consequence of that, I'm going to lack nothing. Because of the kind of shepherd that he is. Now there the psalmist has stated his premise. And the rest of the psalm, we're going to go through fairly quickly, because it just unpacks the rest of it. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> what a joy and pleasure. It will be a pleasure to speak more slowly. Firstly, there's refreshment of soul. Because the Lord is my shepherd... As a result of that, I won't be in want. Here's what flows from that. My R&R &R needs are going to be satisfied. Rest and recreation. Verses 2 to 3a. He makes me lie down in green pastures. You'd like to go do that this afternoon, wouldn't you, That'd be really pleasant. If you were a sheep, it'd be brilliant. Especially if you were an ancient Near Eastern or first century Palestinian sheep. Because green pastures were at a premium. It was hot. There wasn't much grass. Go to Israel today and have a look around and see what the quality of the sheep is like. Because the quality of the grazing is not brilliant. It's not the Tawi Valley, okay? It's green. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He says, whoa, look at this place. 
like, you know, the first time you take your kid into a nice hotel, just for a look. <laughs> wow, look at this place. He lies, leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Firstly, then, there's refreshment of soul, rest and recuperation in green pastures, beside still or quiet waters. Green grass, infinitely preferred by sheep, the only sort they can gain weight and get condition with. Quiet waters. Why quiet waters? What do you know about sheep and quiet waters? Sheep will not drink from anything other than quiet water. They won't drink from a battle in the world. They don't find a quiet pool. They won't drink turbulent water. So here are the two primary things a sheep needs from its shepherd and the nomadic semi-arid grazing systems devoid of enclosed grassland. What time of night did I write that? <laughs> you know, when you have got fields and fences round, right? Every morning they get up, they follow the shepherd out and he goes and finds them. Who does he go and find them? He finds them nice grass and he finds them plenty of water. Yeah. Yeah. Good water. Here's what a sheep needs out of its shepherd and you can't always have it in those conditions. But my shepherd's a great shepherd and he takes me to places like this and he gives me this luxurious pasture and he brings me safely to the fold every night. Green pastures. The green are grassy meadows and water to rest by. That links us back perhaps to Numbers chapter 10, the resting place, the Ark of the Covenant sought out for Israel on its wanderings through the desert. There's lots to follow up, let's not bother. Green pastures, quiet waters. Okay, again, here's the, the refreshment of soul and stuff that's going on. And we tend not to take rest very seriously. And we tend yeah, I need rest. We tend not to take refreshment as a big issue, but it is such a big issue. And we need to do that, because if we're going to be in good nick as the flock of God, if we're going to be any use to him, refreshment is an issue. Now, this isn't, this isn't in any sense a moral, but it doesn't arise at all of any conversation I've had with anybody recently. But there can be, in some places, the tendency to think, I come to church on a Sunday morning, I'm good enough to come, I expect you to take your silver spoon and just fill me. Right? Well, it is our responsibility to see that we are refreshed from the shepherd, isn't it? That's where we get it from. And it is our responsibility to ensure that the relationship is there with the shepherd so that we get that leading beside green pastures, leading beside quiet waters, and that he refreshes my soul. It's not just rest, it's not even resting with God, it's resting up and feeding and drinking so that not just the body but the soul is refreshed and restored, it's not just a day off, it's time lying down in green pastures beside the quiet waters so that he can refresh my soul. So R and R needs satisfied, direction needs satisfied, verse 3b, he guides me along the right paths for his name's sake, guidance. Without admitting it, or wanting what they perceive to be their personal autonomy compromised, in any way, a lot of people in our world spend a lot of time worrying about what right, the right thing to do is. Now, a lot of the guys I meet with in the course of what I do, you know, in my work around here, they, they're not the sort of guys you think would worry too much about stuff like that. Not from first impressions? Believe me, they do. Eliminating. A lot of us, a lot of people in our world spend a lot of time worrying about what they should do, what the right thing is, or whether they've done the right thing, or what they should do next. It occupies a lot of people's minds a lot of the time. I'm not that worried, says the psalmist. He leads me. I trust him to lead me. Delta. He leads me along the right path for his namesake. And our age, I think, probably has so much trouble discovering what the right paths are that they deny they exist. Let, let me say absolutely clearly, right tracks do exist. You should know this. If you lived in the countryside, you'd know this, wouldn't you? Surely? I mean, you know, there's no right track, and you, suddenly you find yourself bumping into trees and dragging yourself through brambles and through ditches. You try living like that. You can't live like that. There are right tracks. And he leads me in there. Why? Because he owes me something? He leads me in them because 
I'll be a pathetic specimen if he doesn't. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. Now what does that mean? What does it mean to say he leads me in those because of his names? What does his name say mean? He's told us his name. Who is my shepherd? Jehovah. Jehovah. Hey, fantastic. I've got it in Hebrew, but we'll do it with all that. And that's fantastic. <laughs> he is my Roy. Right? He is my shepherd. God is my shepherd. But more than that, the God, Jehovah, or whatever, the God who revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush, that's who he is. I am who I am. The one who commissioned Moses to draw together and deliver his redeemed people out of Egypt into the promised land, under the blood, behind the pillars of fire and cloud. The one who led Israel through the wilderness like a flock. That God. That God. The one who is who he is and who will be what he will be. The faithful covenant keeping God. Because of that name that he has, which incorporates all that, he will guide me along the right paths. Does that make sense? He will guide me, sings that psalmist, confidently and with satisfaction, along the right paths, because of the essential personal traits that his name reveals to me about him, that it says to me about who he is and who he's been. Who he will be. He will lead me and guide me faithfully because of who he is. Look, this is true, you know this. We see this in all boys around the place, don't we? You can take sheep away from a shepherd, right? But he's still a shepherd. There are old guys I visit. Some of you know, you know. <laughs> yeah, he may not have any sheep left anymore, he's still a shepherd. Mm -hmm. He's still watching the weather, you know. He's still looking at what the harvest is going to be like. He's still thinking, how many sheep is he going to be able to carry through the winter then? How many is he going to be able to carry through the winter? He still sees something walking down the road and he thinks, that needs a bit of X, Y, Z done to it. It's his nature. And the psalmist sings for joy with a satisfaction that, that this shepherd God, this God whose name is the covenant keeping God. He can't take it out of him. He's going to direct. And he's not going to direct, he is going to protect. Security needs satisfied, verse 4. Even though I walk through ha ha, yeah, the valley of the shadow of death, or the darkest valley, pointing at one thing, I will fear no evil. Because you're with you're with me, and you're being with me, your rod and your staff, they come from me. Now then, two fundamental forms of safeguarding that human beings need. And the first is the protection from external threats, isn't it? That's the one we acknowledge, that's the one we recognise, that's the one we work with. The club. The ancient Near East, Eastern, no, not a soccer club or anything. Um, you know, a club club, a proper club, big lump of stuff you hit people with. That sort of club. The ancient Near Eastern Shepherd had a club with him. David's words to the leaders of the armies of Israel as he set out to defeat Goliath referred to his having gone out in defence of his father's flocks against the lion and the bear, yeah? With just his lightweight weapons. Where you've got to physically do stuff to something <laughs> to make it happen. So here the psalmist pictures himself as a sheep entering the darkest of remote valleys in the fastnesses of the remotest hill country as a vulnerable sheep but doing so with confidence because of the shepherd and his club which he's going to wield doggedly to protect his flock from external threat. So there's the first thing. The first thing he's got a club to protect from external threats but then he's got a crook. Caleb, what's a crook for? Uh, to catch sheep. When they are? Running away. That's it. So he's got the crook to protect the sheep very often from itself. The crook is a thing that is of no use at all against external predators, but is extremely effective in countering the sheep's absolute determination on self-destruction. They want to die, a lot of them. I've got to say. It's the come back here implement. It's the come out of that ditch. It's the let me lift you off that ledge or over that bush implement. Isn't it? Let me get you out of there. 
And this valley that NIV translates as the darkest valley, that's the non, that, that, that is the literal trans translation of the Hebrew tzalmawet, which literally refers to the ultimate dark part of human experience. Okay? So it's that expression which gets used to describe the valley of the shadow of death, the darkest of human experiences, the darkest valley we go through. It's the dark valley. You know? As if you, instead of saying, death, which sounds horrible, and you want to say it, you want to go there, oh, to pull up for that. The darkest valley. It's like, passed away, isn't it? It didn't. <laughs> but we say it, and that's a circumlocution that helps us. Derek Kidner, in his little commentary, makes a revealing observation on that. We've, we've dealt with that expression already. Derek Kidner says, only the Lord can lead a man through death. Now, hang on a minute, let's get this straight. Only the Lord can lead a man through death. All other guides turn back. And the traveller must go on alone. Not so the shepherd. Who we now know far better than the psalmist did, as being a safe pair of hands in that direction. Even there, says the psalmist, even there where the club protects and the crook rescues the Lord's people, my security needs are satisfied. I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I'll fear no evil. For you're with me. Your rod, external predators, your staff, oh, rescue me from myself. Go with me. And we were, we were talking about, let a go and yarn in the week. We were, we were talking about. Some of the people that I've known over the years who have come from a non-Christian background perhaps, or even just a church background and rejected it and whatever, who over the years have actually become Christians. And because of who I am, what I do and all the rest of it, I've been privileged to be there as they passed into the glory. And you just see how God preserves his people through the valley of the shadow. There's no, there's no way of putting words to describe it. Except things like stupid things like you know, like a ship in full sail, kind of thing. and the most the most nervous disposition becomes transformed because the rod and the staff are there, and they're being guided through the valley of the shadow of death. God's people persevere, and God's people persevere because God preserves His people. He's the shepherd. Does this give points to the things we exist for as a church? Isn't this where the chips come down? This is what we're for. We're to introduce people to the shepherd who takes them through the darkest of valleys that they will ever experience, and does so gloriously. Robinson. staff. Security needs, oh here we go, R&R &R needs satisfied, direction needs satisfied, security needs satisfied, feasting needs satisfied. Got to have a feast. Do you believe me? A feast is a very important thing. Human beings need to feast. Of faith, it? <laughs> what on earth am I talking about? Okay, it's okay, you just, you know, it's okay, it's all right. Um, this is really important. How can we miss this? As Christians, how have we missed it? We're going through a summer of festivals, right? What's happening in Edinburgh at the moment? Festival. Yeah. What's been happening at sort of, Glastonbury and in Reading and, you know, uh, all over the place. Yeah. Festivals, one sort and another. The music festivals, there are poetry festivals, there are terrible spectacle festivals. We've had a jazz festival in Tandela, right? Bigger one in Brecon, but we don't talk about that. <laughs> there, there's, there's, whether it's high culture, it's comedy, it's world music, uh, whether our own small nations festival near Tandelvery happens every now and again, the festival in the desert in Timbuktu. Yeah. There seems to be a human need everywhere. In every culture there's this thing. Everywhere we need to festival and we need to feast. Why is that? Why is that? I, I could account for it in terms of a, sort of a forward echo of the future that lies ahead of God's people. Something deeply implanted in the human spirit. That, that there's this forward looking echo of the feast of the Lamb in future glory. There's something in us that, that cries out because of the way the Creator has made us. He's a, he's a a festivaling and he's a feasting God. The wedding feast of the Lamb is going to be what it all goes towards, right? I could, I could think, oh, maybe there's an echo of the future there that, that makes us want to participate in that, just the way we've got a creator God and he wants us, makes us want to make things. We get satisfaction out of creation and art and design and mending engines. And, you know, 
But we do, don't we? Because we've got a creator God and he's made us in his image, right? So we like to party. Is there a problem? Okay, well, my party might look different from yours. Yeah? What do you mean, yes? <laughs> Try not so enthusiastic. Right? But, but, but <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a party. If you're not up for parties, quit. Because, because it's going to be a party. It's going to be good. This bit is quite interesting. Verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. It's not a picnic in the park. See, we directly associate tables with taking on fuel, right? TV dinner, we're not gone. But we've got the psalmist coming at us out of a different thought world. In his world, tables are almost incidentally places for filling your face. Much more to do with fellowship and blessing. In the first part, there's this illusion. You prepare a table before me in the very presence of my enemies. You don't sit down to a meal with your enemies. You do where God's concerned. He's in the business of turning things around in the whole creation. So we get this, the lion sits down with the lamb. The lion lies down with the lamb. Come on, at dinner. Different thought world going on here. And the second part, there's this elaboration on this idea of turning feeding and fellowship into feasting. Oil on the head, particular blessing, special meals. A cup that isn't simply replenished, but a cup that overflows. Is that a human need? If you've ever had to struggle to uh, make tight funds stretch, you know it can be very important to manage whatever budget you have to ensure that there is the occasional treat. Whatever shape that comes in, right? Whatever shape that comes in. Because not doing so denies a fairly basic human need to enjoy an occasional treat. There are blogs out there about that, for people who are having trouble making the food money stretch. There are blogs out there to say, here's how you just create yourself something that's special to eat one day. Actually. What happens here then is that the psalmist points out the way that the good shepherd goes a bit beyond, beyond the absolute necessary in his provision for his sheep. Somebody said to me once about a particular eccentric lady, her cattle don't want for much. And it was the joy of her life. That the cattle didn't want from that. It's some cracking cattle. Such is the blessing of God, and the psalmist sees and understands the need to stop, rejoice, and sing of the little and the large abundances of God's provision for his people. And it is that meditation on the richness of God, despite the darkness of the valleys, that feeds his confidence and feeds his hope for the future. Because, you know, it is very human to be worried about your future. But if God is your shepherd, look, surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, the, the guy we referred to just, just now, Douglas Macmillan, was uh, he's a preacher in the, the Free Church of Scotland, and uh, he was a, a bad lad, he was converted, he was a shepherd on Ardenmachan Point, which is that bit of Scotland that sticks out into the, into the sea towards Ireland. Fairly bleak, hard existence. Huge, huge guy. And he, I remember speaking on, on Psalm 23 years and years and years and years ago when I was a young Christian. And he spoke about goodness and mercy following him all the days of his life. And he said, I'll probably never shepherd again, but if I did, I'd have a brace of dogs. I'd call one and I'd call the other mercy. Goodness and mercy. <laughs> One's goodness and mercy. A pair of dogs working together. Because here's how God's goodness and his mercy work together to shepherd his people. So here are the basic needs of God's flock being met abundantly. In the psalm and in the meditation of the psalmist there's this satisfaction and rejoicing and joy about all that. And that's all going on in a pretty early stage in the history of the people of God but this psalm is known straight away the importance of singing of your satisfaction with God. Be satisfied with God. It's important to be satisfied with your God and to sing of the satisfaction. Because it's all too easy, isn't it, to sing of the other stuff. It's all too easy to sing of the stuff that speaks to us about the fallen creation and sin's effect and so on. And what happens then? 
that comes to control, I think. And of course we go beyond all this, we go far beyond all this, because we go forward to John chapter 10. And we see that the shepherd of the psalm, oh we know who he is now then, here he is, he's been, his name is Jesus. He is the good shepherd. This is a picture of the great shepherd in Psalm 23, good shepherd. Now we know a name for him, now we've seen a lot more of him, we know what he does. And John 10 tells us that, that all the Father gives to him for his flock come to him. And, and no one can pluck them out of his hand. Is the Father's given it. At that point, what is explicit in the wilderness shepherding of the people of God in, in Exodus and in Psalm 23 is leading the flock. It becomes very plain. The sheep to whom the blessings of this psalm apply are characterized there in John 10 by hearing the shepherd's voice, by rejecting all other voices and following him. And then we get through to, you know, much later, Hebrews, the epistle of the Hebrews, to so another bunch of people like the recipients of John's Gospel, like the people in uh, getting Psalm 23, who are steeped in Old Testament history. And there at the end of Hebrews, who is the shepherd? The good shepherd of John 10 has become the great shepherd of Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the valley of the shadow of death, sorry, Brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, may you work in us what's pleasing to him. Mm -hmm. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Mm -hmm. Here's the point. Happy sheep rejoice at the satisfaction, the well-being of having the Lord as their shepherd, because they recognize the blessing that brings. Mm -hmm. Up against whatever this world's got to throw. The sheep without a shepherd is not an independent, but a miserable beast. And they don't survive well in a state of nature. But the shepherd in sheep is as how he has. And he sings about it. He sings about it. Because that sheep rejoices in the work of the shepherd. Can't deny the reality of dark days, can you? Can't deny the reality of death's dark veil. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who preached a little while ago in London, you may have heard of him. He used to say he reckoned it was his business every week to tell people they were going to die. Can you imagine that? I mean, you're going to die. I mean, you know, how does that go down? It's really well. He dressed as an undertaker. Really, yeah, he dressed as an undertaker. Oh, that's a bit harsh. Um, but he's pointing to the shepherd who takes us through these realities. God will shepherd you through, if you follow the shepherd. Mm -hmm. And that puts a song of satisfaction in the well shepherded human heart. Can you sing it yet? Mm -hmm.